okay. very effective. It'll cool down very quickly. Yeah. Well, all right. Let's let's start in uh, talking about this lecture, and it's really good to see everyone, and it's great to be here in person. And uh, even though we just had the first documented case of monkeypox in New York City, we're not going to we're not going to freak out about it, right? It's all right. <laughs> let's, it never ends. Never ends. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now, this lecture, uh, humanity's relationship to time. What could be more interesting than time? I mean, time is, it's such a important thing. It's hard to say exactly what it is. Uh, there's an article I read, um, a scientific article. It starts this way. Um, the philosopher Augustine of Hippo once wrote that he felt he knew what time was so long as no one asked him. <laughs> Fast forward 16 centuries and the picture has hardly changed, says physicist Carlo Rovelli. Time is, quote, perhaps the greatest mystery, he says. Quote, at the most fundamental level we currently know of, there is little that resembles time as we experience it. The passage of time, a uniform universal flow that transports us inexorably from a past we cannot revisit to a future we cannot know, is perhaps the most fundamental experience of our existence. Yet our best theories suggest that it is not real. Time doesn't flow and past, present and future cannot sensibly be defined. There isn't even one single time that governs the order of events. <coughs> so that's from a scientific article, April of 2018. Mm -hmm. The guide, path guide says, Time is a creation of the mind. Um, another scientific article, this is uh, last year, I think, in Science, in Sci um, New Scientist. Some time ago, students at the University of Tennessee were handed an unusual assignment. Imagine yourself as a Lilliputian, they were told, as they stared at a miniature model of their communal lounge, complete with furniture and figurines. The students were asked to put themselves in the little people's shoes, relaxing on the tiny chairs with minuscule cups of coffee. Then they had to say when they felt 30 minutes had passed. For the notionally shrunken students, time flew. Their estimates fell well short of clock time. Even more curiously, the acceleration in their felt time was proportional to the scale of the model lounges in which they were immersed. This bizarre result reported in Science in 1981 is occasionally invoked by neuroscientists to suggest that space and time are folded together in the brain as they are in the universe. So with that introduction, um, this lecture is about a lot of things. It's a lot about, a, it is about managing time well, but that sounds, sounds kind of prosaic. It's about um, using time in the best way, I think, right? I mean, fundamentally, we have two hours, right? So the question is, how are we gonna use this time best? And the guide talks about how kind of to tell when you're not using time well, and how to tell when you are using time well, and then introduces this concept of extended time. All right. Page one. In the introduction, the guide says a few things which are not directly related to the theme of the lecture. He talks about the pathwork group is a living growing organism because it stands on a healthy foundation enabling many more individuals to cultivate their growth so I was kind of thinking about that in relationship to our group, right? We, ha we have a group. This group uh, is an entity of sorts. And this group itself can be considered a living and growing organism, which stands on a healthy foundation. And that healthy foundation, of course, is the work that we're all doing, the path work we all do. So when we do this work, the guide says, such help and contribution is of great value and the cosmic forces thank such people in their own way. 
our thanks, if we may call it that for lack of a better word, takes the, take the form of particular blessings not easily and instantly recognizable. Their reality is perceived only in deep meditation. Now that's something I, I kind of pondered, you know, the, the idea that somehow what we're doing and the appreciation or the resonance that we have from other spiritual realms is something that we can feel in deep meditation. That, that's very meaningful to me. So then the guide starts in on the, on the subject of what time is. As I said before, the guide says that time is a creation of the mind. Without the mind, time does not exist. In your dimension, time, space, and movement are three separate elements of reality. When humanity reaches a higher degree of consciousness and with it an extended dimension, time, space, and movement begin to integrate more and more <clears throat> until they become one. So I think that's pretty much in, in, um, in accord with what science tells us. Certainly what Einstein said about the fact that all these three aspects are interdependent, time, space, and movement. Then the guy talks about there are many extended times. And I think later on, he elaborates on this, talking about um, how it's possible sort of to get out of your state of kind of being a slave to different ideas of time and entering an extended time space where we feel more relaxed and more at one with things as they are, maybe more, we're more able to be in the now. All right. And so the guy basically says that in the second paragraph on page two, that time is really a gift, right? A gift to us. Because it's at the disposal of human beings so that they can grow, fulfill themselves, experience, and reach happiness and liberation <clears throat> up to the limit commensurate with this dimension. All right. So to the degree they fulfill their potential through inner growth, their life will be a dynamic and full experience within which the limitation of time will not be a hardship. Now the guide later on, of course, uh, talks about the limitation, the limiting concepts of time. I'll get to that in a minute or two. All right. In what I call the second section of the lecture, the guy talks about using time well, different ways to use time. Um, and I think that to summarize, the guide really says that when you get to the heart of the matter and you're able to use your time as best as you can, you experience a beautiful feeling of being in the now. And if you don't utilize time well, it becomes a burden and a source of conflict. He says, how many times does it happen that you find yourself in a negative mood without learning the deep lesson behind it or seeing its significance for your innermost being? All right, so the tip off here is um, when you are in a bad state of mind, a negative state of mind, when you're experiencing something unpleasant, disharmonious, then you have to see its significance. You have to, in every lecture, right, the guide says this, that it's important to go into whatever the feelings of conflict and discomfort are. If you try to avoid them, then you get caught, as the guide says, more and more to such periods of depression, anxiety, uncertainty, and disharmony. If you do not pay attention to them, finding the inner cause will become more difficult. In these instances, you do not utilize time well, and it becomes a burden and a source of conflict. All right, and now, next paragraph. Drum roll, please. Listlessness, depression, impatience, nervousness, anxiety, tension, frustration, boredom, apathy, and hostility, all these emotions and many others are in the last analysis a result of underutilized time or unutilized time. 
right? So, I mean, the bullshit that we get hung up on happens because we don't, we decide not to take the time to use the time to understand what's going on, right? Straightforward enough. And then the guide says something on at the end of page two, which is really meaningful to me. And I know it's meaningful to uh, us path workers who remember the path work way back. He says, to those of my friends who have experienced liberation from such emotions with an influx of strength and inner joy, feeling that they are at one with life, I say, you can experience, repeat this experience whenever you do not shirk the effort of looking deep into yourselves until you discover the origin of all the negative emotions. And um, what the guide says is that to really deeply experience the negative emotions and to go through them gives you a, a blissful feeling of timelessness. And I can certainly say that's, that's exactly what I experienced many times when I, when I was able to really fully go into these negative uh, feelings and kind of come out on the other end of it. Right? Um, I mean, Barbara, you remember uh, times like that, that we, we, you know, felt the kind of liberation that comes from really going into something as deeply as you can, acknowledging the negativities, uh, un unburdening yourself of them. So, and the guide says, if you analyze each negative emotion, you will find that it conflicts with the limited fragment of time at your disposal. This may be a very good meditation exercise and will and well lend itself to deeper exploration. Constructive, realistic, and positive feelings do not conflict with time because time is utilized as it is supposed to be. I guess that feels pretty straightforward, right? Um, but let's try to take some examples, right? Can we do that? Um, if you analyze each negative emotion, you will find that it conflicts with the limited fragment of time at your disposal. Now let's figure out what exactly that means. Like, let's say that, um, you know, I personally, I'm kind of feeling negative about something that could happen tomorrow. Um, I'm gonna, I have to take care of my mom, which is fine, but my sister is supposed to take care of my mom and I wanna do something else. So I'm kind of a little angry about the fact that my sister is bailing out so that's a negative emotion, you know? So um, I'm like, I feel stuck in that negative emotion. So how does that conflict with a limited fragment of time at your disposal? Well, I felt that going to my higher self in this situation, I felt I had to yield to what the situation is yield to the fact that what I may be, what I, what I may be, uh, the other thing I might want to do may not be as important as taking care of my mom, yielding to the fact that my sister has her own issues and I can let it go. And then I don't feel conflicted and then I feel relaxed and I don't feel burdened. So, and maybe it, it doesn't keep absorbing my time. So maybe when you resolve a negative feeling by surrendering, to the reality of the situation, you are then freeing up time to be better utilized. Does that make sense, lady and gentlemen? Yes. Yes. Can I add something? Then? Kevin, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, should we pass the machine around a little bit? Yeah, just yeah. go ahead, that Kevin. The last question that you asked about how this relates to time, I feel as though. Um, it inspired something in me, a, re, a feeling that it has for me to do a lot with energy flow. Um, when I'm upset about something like the example that you gave, Alan, um, I feel rather blocked in some way. I feel as though there's a, a hardened mass somewhere within my energy body, perhaps, and that prevents me from flowing and moving along with life as it is dynamic. And so in that process, um, that block is preventing the energy from flowing in a relaxed manner, let's say, inside of me. And 
flow takes time. So hence, if your energy flow is blocked or you feel tightened or constrained or upset or blocked about something, uh, you're spinning your wheels in a sense. You're exerting so much more effort to move that energy and, and, and try to, I guess, live without expressing uh, the block, right? But if you learn to express the block and get through where that energy is stuck, and that's what the path work tends to discuss very often as it's in this lecture, um, then the energy flow feels much more comfortable, right? The freedom that uh, the, the guide talks about is there. And uh, then beyond that, then time is utilized because now the energy is flowing uh, effectively and uh, comfortably, okay? Yeah, thank you. So that was uh, my personal example of uh, this concept of how you can use time better um, by, by allowing, surrendering to the negative emotion and, and coming, coming to grips with it. Also, otherwise you just fight. Yeah, Tracy. If, if you don't accept that you're gonna be taking care of your mother tomorrow, not only are you gonna lose that time that you otherwise have something else you wanted to do, but you're, you're using time up right now. It's like Don Quixote fight, fighting against the windmills. They're still going to turn. You're still going to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Page three, third section. Um, now the guy talks about something that's familiar to all of us, which is that we are both, we're, we're trying to hurry into the future and we're afraid of it. Right, we are we are striving against. We we don't like and this this thing that the guide always says, which I feel is deeply rooted in, in everyone's consciousness, is that somehow we feel that things aren't right. We shouldn't be here. There's something about the way things work on Earth that is a little counterintuitive. Right. I mean, we feel that our communication should be faster. We feel we should understand people better. We, we, we kind of long for a freedom that exists in the spirit world that we dimly recollect, right? So um, that feeling, we're straining, the guide says, because we're out here on earth, we're straining against this limitation, straining as a dog pulls at its leash, as the guide says. Time holds you in its grip and you feel imprisoned in a fragment of reality. The unconscious, the unconscious still has a memory of the great experience of timelessness and tries to find its way back into a limitless freedom. This can be done, but only by accepting and fully utilizing the fragment you call time. There we are again, right? The only way to feel it, to deal with it, to be in the now is to utilize it in a constructive way. And then the transition into freedom will be an organic flow with a minimum of conflict. So the guide says, when we strive to reach a freer dimension of time translated into practical life, it manifests by striving toward tomorrow. And he says, people strive toward tomorrow for two reasons. One, you do not like the present and hope for something better from the future or else you fear a certain aspect of life and want to leave it behind in the past. So what that means, of course, is that, as he says, then by that, in that, in that double striving, what you do is you, you're away from the now. You strain away from the now. You avoid living in the now. And then, of course, for the third time, he repeats, if, however, you were to explore within yourself the reasons for your unfulfillment and the difficulties which cause you to strain away from them, and fulfillments, you would be capable of living in the now fully, meaningfully, and dynamically, deriving all the many joys from each moment that you now overlook. If each moment were lived full, truly lived to its fullest, you would already reach an extended dimension of time while still remaining in this earth dimension. Now, that's kind of an interesting thing, this extended dimension of time, which I think maybe could be called the mystical experience. I mean, that is a way of being in the world, but not of the world. It is a way of having deeper connections with reality 
than we typically do. And that I think is what the guide means or what I, what I interpret uh, in, this, in this idea, the concept of the um, extended dimension of time. Only by fully utilizing the, the dimension you live in can you outgrow it. <clears throat> Experiencing everything that each moment of time contains will stop you from straining away. You will thereby automatically find yourself flowing into the next time dimension. <clears throat> now this, <clears throat> I suppose you can also achieve by the practice of mindfulness. At least it helps. <clears throat> so the fourth section, the way I see it, awareness is the first step, of course. That's the keystone of the pathwork, right? Um, become aware of your <clears throat> inner striving away from the now. You will then find that you struggle against the now because you have not really found and resolved the causes that make you strain into the future. That's the straining into the future. The second one is the fear of the future, because the future also means death and decay. While they strain into the future, hoping for, for fulfillment, they simultaneously stem against the tide of time, desiring to stop its movement or even go backward into youth. People want two impossible things, he summarizes. The fulfillment of the future in the past, or at least in the present, this wish generates two contradictory soul movements. One strains forward, the other holds back. Needless to say, the soul suffers from tension, a useless and destructive waste of energy. Then of course he talks about the fear of death, which is another thing about the path work. The path work always talks about death being an illusion and the fear of it though needing to be confronted. And of course, as the guide always says, uh, he who is afraid of death is afraid of life. It's really the same thing. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so if you if you are able or willing to look at the negative emotions and to transcend them and be in the now, then he says the wave of time will bring you naturally and gracefully into the next extended dimension which you fear so much because you cannot yet prove its reality. So here again is the pathwork theme of justified faith. In other words, the little leaps that we take into the unit estate should give you faith that the bigger leaps are also possible. And the biggest leap, of course, being the transition from life to, to what is called death. Death, which really doesn't exist according to the, to the pathwork guide. Now, in the final section, um, the guy talks about how to live in the now. And the, and the daily review, he of course mentions again, it's one of the best means toward living each day and each hour fully. I venture to say that all my friends who work so diligently on this path have at least occasionally experienced the special peace that is full of the spark of aliveness as dynamic as it is peaceful, even after having recognized in all its depth, a distortion or a negative attitude in themselves. This is also something I was referring to before, you know, that when you get to the root of some of a negative pattern and image, when you immerse yourself in your misconception and you express it and you expose it and you reveal it, then all of a sudden you feel peacefulness and you feel a sense of being in the now. And that is undeniable. I've experienced that many times. That is, that's a big deal. You know, when that happens, you never forget it. And of course the guide embroiders on that a little bit in the last paragraph on page four, he says that the recognition itself about your shit, you know, your negativity, may be very unflattering and disillusioning about oneself and at times even painful, mm -hmm. will not diminish the great experience once the recognition is complete. On the contrary, this may furnish the best proof of the truth of my words. 
whenever a self-confrontation does not in the end produce an uplifting experience, you have not found all that is to be discovered. This knowledge should not make you impatient or tense, but rather help you to understand that you are hedging the truth in some way. You do not wish to see all there is to see. So, you know, that's what I'm wondering about whether what, how much you can experience of that kind of recognition in a discussion group. I mean, it helps to con conceptually understand it, but you know, to feel the emotions that go along with that kind of a recognition, that's an important thing to do. And that's what, we, of course, we do in a pathway process. Remember, Teresa said when she found the green girl that she, for two weeks after that, she was just like in a state of extended bliss. Right, right, right. Remember Teresa. <laughs> yeah, I remember the story. Hey, Teresa, you there? Not Teresa, the. Oh, ter no, Teresa Halloran. Nurse. Yes, the nurse, no, yes. Yes, the nurse. Not, not you, Teresa, yeah, I mean, the other Teresa. <laughs> right, yes. Uh, all right, and then so to wrap up the lecture, um, the guide says that um, why is it that after an unflattering, this is critical, I think, after an unflattering or painful recognition, provided you go to its very depth and do not stop halfway, you experience such a dynamic state of harmony and aliveness. It is so only because at that moment you have fully utilized what is given to you, the fragment of time at your disposal. When you are listless and depressed or in any way unhappy, the material is there right in front of you. You are right in it, but you are blind to it. You do not focus your attention on it. You merely try to get out of this now without, re without utilizing it. This, that is the forward movement, which also causes your fear of growing into death, which is actually a threshold of life. Therefore, you hold back while you also push forward. Fear of death exists. Now, does everybody understand how important that is? I mean, that's really the heart of the path of self-facing, of self-confrontation, um, that the ego is reluctant, right? to experience the negative. The ego thinks that the negative is either something that shields it from the realities of life, or it, the negative is sort of a, um, let me think about this for a minute. Um, well, the ego, the negative is a threat to the ego. So first of all, the ego wants to deny it, right? I mean, anything that's negative means you're not perfect. And if, if, if you're not perfect, that's really bad. The ego doesn't want to admit that or, or conceive of it. So first it wants to deny the negative. Then it wants to exaggerate the negative and wrap the negative around itself so it doesn't have to deal with the divine self, with the higher self. That's the way I see it. So when the material is presented and we don't confront it or we don't allow ourselves to get into it, we don't utilize time well. All right. So he says, of course, wrapping it up, the only way to experience the flow of time that knows no interruption, that brings you into extended dimensions is to utilize each living moment in the manner you learn to do on this path. Then you no longer deal with concepts which you adopt or reject, which you agree or disagree with. An inner experience comes into being that makes you realize that the present matrix of time is only one facet of another matrix of time. It is but a fragment of a bigger piece. This in itself brings the knowledge that death is but an illusion Death is merely a manifestation of transition into a different dimension. However, such words can be meaningful only if you make the experience of their reality possible. For that, this pathwork gives you ample opportunity. And the tools. <laughs> so, I mean, we're all very fortunate to be here, and not only uh, practicing the pathwork, but on the planet Earth where we have the ability to confront our negativities and we have the ability to 
to penetrate the fog of confusion that surrounds our souls uh, with these tools. All right, so that is, that's my interpretation, my summary. And um, would somebody like to talk about their experience of some of these things, either online or here? I would like to, um, that's okay. Sure. Yeah, um, maybe. sure. So th this lecture to me really opened up, oh, I guess a whole new chapter in path work in that I feel for the first time, even more of a connection with, um, the idea of looking at what presents itself and the lesson I'm supposed to learn from that. I, I struggle with, um, you know, a, a feeling of negativity comes up and I'll right away jump to, oh, what lesson should I be learning? Rather than kind of remaining in the negativity till I actually feel the feel the feeling. Um, maybe even feel the feeling from where where it originated, and then ask the question, what is the lesson here? And if I take use of time, because that's what I have, if I can use that time, then that time I have in the present to work on that is just, it's so valuable. So um, I was really appreciative of this lesson in that it just bring, brought a lot of clarity to this um, and to the concepts. I do have a question, however, you know, I understand all the, you know, I guess there's the negative feelings of listness and um, anxiety. What about procrastination? There is a lecture about procrastination actually. Uh, and laziness. There's a lecture about that. I think it's called procrastination, the dynamic state of laziness. Is that? Or maybe I'm, I maybe I'm mixing up two titles. Um, but there is, a, there is a lecture. But yeah, procrastination is. Um, well, you're not using time well. You're not using time well. <laughs> we'll, we'll get. We'll give you that. Right. No, I. I, I figured that much. <laughs> um, do you mean any deeper meaning or, or concept uh, to illuminate procrastination in terms of the path work? Um, well, I mean. Right. Not in terms of path work, but just more so in terms of life. Um, uh, Joel. Yeah. Hesitation. Hesitation, yeah. Um, well, I'll try to answer that and, and let Joel talk about it, but Mef, it's good to see you. I didn't realize you were here for a minute. Who is? Um, Mef, Mary Ford, she's a longtime path worker, helper, emeritus, a special. She's in the, in the middle of Hollywood Squares right there. Oh, okay. She's, she's, uh, right there. Hi, um. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi, good to see you. Um, Joel? You, Joel, you want to say something about the hesitation or procrastination? Yeah, I don't remember now, Alan, where I, I saw this. If it was in a, one of the, I don't remember where I saw this, if it was in one of the lectures or something else that I was studying, but it was talking about the lack of motivation. And so, so procrastination is, is a lack of motivation, right? It's like, I know I, I want to do this, but there's something that's preventing me from doing it. And so, so you kind of get stuck in, I'm not going to move forward, right? And so, the, so there's several elements here. One is the Pathwork talks about the importance of movement, of expending energy. So, so I, I know myself, you know, I'm older, I get tired. It's nice to sit in my chair and, you know, whatever, take a nap or, you know, drift off and then but it can be limiting right but i notice if i say come on joel let's get up and do something right whatever i i made some snack for 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 later on and so then i i'm 
I noticed almost immediately my energy shifts, right? So I went from being kind of lazy, maybe even ready to fall asleep. And now suddenly I'm energized, I'm doing something. So this is kind of a theme. I, I'm not sure if I saw this in the path work, but it was talking about the importance of utilizing energy. And, and so that goes to this question of time, right? That if, if time is limited, as we know it in this dimension, then we, we, need to, we need to act, right? So procrastination is form of being stuck. The other thing is that, you know, like late, late, to kind of segue to laziness, all right? So if too much procrastination is, is kind of a form of laziness, right? Um, so laziness, as, as it was explained in something I was reading, I'm not sure if it was a lecture, um, comes from a lack of motivation and it's actually a form of depression. And so where, what it comes from is are unresolved things that have happened to us at other times in our life, right? So it's very loving, this definition that people aren't lazy, right? That's, 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 that's a value judgment, right? You're lazy, so therefore you're not, you're not as good as somebody who's doing, um, but it comes from unresolved conflicts, <clears throat> usually from the past, right? So as we do more work on ourselves and we're more present to the issues that are presenting themselves in, in the present, we will become mo more motivated. Right? I have something to add as well, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if it's okay. Just, hi everyone. On the state of procrastination, I guess I would first ask, um, or first I would say, in what manner is it experienced? Because, um, we all need rest first off and recuperation time. And I think it's important first to recognize that if we're labeling something procrastination, it might be arising from something underlying in a cross current um, within your soul, within your um, emotional state. And if that disturbance within uh, speaks of a given uh, motivating force, um, then that procrastination could be understood based upon that motivating force beneath it. Um, what one person experiences as procrastination may be motivated from a completely different uh, place than another person's same behavior of procrastination. Um, and so that's why it's important to do the inner work, I feel, um, because by, by looking within and recognizing what the energy within you is stating, um, what the disturbance is and what it's fighting against and, and what the ideal may be that you wish you could live up to is not being attained or achieved in the manner that your ego believes it should be. That's the question. Um, when you rest and when you take time away from activity, um, the should state kind of resolves itself. It feels right. But when we're labeling something procrastination, it's often a disturbance that something that should be done or could be done is not being done. Um, and so it might be an item that's uh, self-deprecating. It might be a feeling of worthlessness. It might be a feeling of stubbornness. It might be um, something inside for um, impatience, right? That I just wish things would happen a lot quicker, but now I'm stuck here. There are so many different ways that beneath a single movement or inactivity, um, the energy state might be speaking to you in a different manner. So I would just suggest that um, whoever brought that up, that you look within at what the motivating uh, energy is. And, and I think take some self-care in the process because you're not, you don't need to solve it immediately. It's there to teach you something. So in the process, I guess it's making friends with your lower self and to be compassionate um, to yourself and to say, you know, this, this disturbance is here as my friend right now. I, I need to love this part of me. And, and when, it's, when I'm ready for that, I will. I will, I know I will, I have faith that I will. 
And so um, I think that's part of the opening up uh, into the lower self where you can then allow it to um, be constructive and to trust in, in some of that disturbance and, and burden within. That's a very valuable insight, I think. Tracy, thoughts, Mark? Um, yeah, you know, also I feel procrastination is one of those kind of paradox, right? Because as I mentioned before, that we kind of have a feeling that things are not right and that we belong in a kind of different world. <clears throat> Just the idea that you want to do something and another part of you says no, that's sort of incongruous. That's what cognitive dissonance, that is something like, wait a second, how can a part of me want to do something and another part says no? So it's, 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 a, it's revelatory about our nature, about how we sit in duality. Yeah, can I just uh, quick, quickly very simple. Oh, so, uh, hi, yes. Um, yeah, I, the way I see it, uh, honestly, is uh, uh, procrastination. Um, I think the, it's, it is maybe, I mean, it's, it's different, maybe different for everybody, but I think um, it may be just a way of avoiding escaping and that may be related to um, maybe other aspects of our personality where we are also trying to escape and trying to avoid facing the issue that is right in front of us that this lecture talks about um, you know we try to avoid I mean in this case of pro procrastinating uh, to avoid the things that we know needs to get done we need to do it we need to get it done but it just doesn't feel right to do it now or I'm not in the mood to do it now and you just keep postponing it. And honestly, the more you postpone it, the more you are going to postpone it because you just postpone it. Okay, I'll do it next time. And then, then again, no, I'll do it later. And then like that. And if you don't determine, if you don't make that determination of getting it done in the moment when it comes, when you arrive, when you know and you feel you have to do it, then you, you, sooner or later, we have to really face that moment and get the thing done because it's not going to get done by itself. So um, the way I see it is yeah, it's just a, maybe... Uh, a way of uh, maybe escaping the moment and not really facing, um, you know, those uh, the, the the moment and the reality of the moment and the even the the and and really the thing I think to be done, the way I see is to maybe just like any other negative feeling, just basically feel it, experience it with it, and just really experience in that moment what is it that I am feeling, what is it inside of me that is causing me not to want to do what I need to do. That, you know that I I rather avoid it than to you know uh, than to actually face it and, and get it done. Yeah, I guess it's also fair to say that if you if you keep letting the merry go around go around without grabbing the brass ring, eventually you're going to have to get off the merry go round. Uh, if that's a good metaphor, um, you know the guide says at some point that if if somebody persistently refuses to show up for the task that they were meant to show up for in life, they will decide to die. Um, they will check out. So, I mean, the, 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 I suppose that's the greatest example of procrastination going to its, its you know, a terminal case of procrastination of, like, hey, you know, we all agreed, we all agreed to come here to fulfill a task, to do certain things, big or small. And if we persistently say, hey, you know what, I'm not doing it. I, I'm not showing up. I'm not, metaphorically, I'm not going to get out of bed. Then well, you'll see the pings keep growing. You <laughs> will, okay. you will uh, keep escalating until one day it's death. I guess. One day, and you'll, you'll, yeah. you'll have to meet everyone in the spirit world, and they'll yeah. say, you know, better luck next. Better luck we'll next time. That life up. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Yeah, go ahead, John. So, Alan, what about and, and everybody else? Uh, fear of success, fear, fear of the higher self. How does that play into progress? Well, I mean, that's part of the, what Joel asked is about fear of success. And that, of course, I think is um, very much explored in the path work. Um, the, the, well, the, there's the shame of the higher self, the higher self. right? That's, that's, you know, and that's interesting because, hey, Meph, if you want to jump in on any of this, you're <laughs> more than welcome. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, um, it may be that experiencing the higher self is success. It's not worldly success, right? I mean, it, if you come to grips with who you are and what your task is and, and, and what is meaningful for you, 
as the guide very often says, it may not be the thing that is meaningful in the eyes of others, right? Like when someone enters a religious order, like a lot of people would say that, that that's dumb, you're running away from the world, but it may be the most meaningful thing for a person to do, although it's not quote unquote successful, right? Right. Um, I, you know, Stephen, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry for interrupt. I'd just like to jump back for a minute to procrastination. I think it's a good segue what you just said. You know, one never knows whether it's good or bad. Uh, I, I never procrastinate because I never label myself as a procrastinator. And I prefer to label as maybe I just need that space and time. Yeah. Or maybe I need whatever I'm doing to do it. That's what Kevin said, you know, right? You know, there's something called neuro linguistic programming, and the words we use, we program ourselves with. Mm -hmm. I knew somebody. As a child, they told me, you're not that smart. And he grew up saying, I'm not that smart. Cancel, cancel. I don't want to have it all myself. So he actually was quite bright, but because they kept labeling him not, quote, not so smart, he fulfilled it. Now, I, I would not, I don't think I procrastinate. I don't know what I do. <laughs> I just have a lot of different feelings. And I feel that's the feeling that has to come up at the moment. Let's experience it. But as soon as I label it, I become it. And that's very dangerous. And, and our culture then tends to analyze it and go into it. And the higher self, no, it's the lower self. It's the fear of this. It's the fear of success. And we spend $20 million at a therapist. What for? I've come to believe that this is it at the moment. And what is the feeling in my body? not the label, bring it down to the belly. What's my feeling? And that is much more instructive and educational and helpful than putting a label on it and trying to analyze it in my head. Anyway, that's just my own experience. You know, Kevin's just nodding his head. Well said. And I think you Thank are you. coming, you are close to, to the unitive state, Stephen. I think you are. Thank you. You can feel it. Amen. Well, he's overcome the symbol of my brother. He says, Kevin says, you recognize that words are just symbols. Yeah. You know, everybody uses words. Society has a certain. It's like a map. I could have a map of Paris, but it's not Paris. I'm looking at a map. Exactly. I don't get the experience of Paris. <laughs> I'd much rather have the experience of Paris and walking through it than looking at a piece of paper that says, oh, they, there's Paris. Well, anyway, that's my analogy. I'm, I'm buying that. That relates well to this lecture, by the way, because utilize the time. Yeah, utilizing is time is not looking at the map. Is not looking. At <laughs> Kevin says <laughs> utilizing time is not looking at the map. It's 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 being <laughs> in Paris. It's being in Paris. <laughs> That's me with the GPS. <laughs> All right, uh, Matt, do you have any thoughts, Barbara? Uh, um. I actually tuned in tonight because of this concept of procrastination. And for the past, I would say three or four years, uh, even before COVID, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Um, I find that the things I'm not doing are largely because there's something else I'd rather be doing and that something else involves sitting in my easy chair and uh, either playing uh, solitaire on the computer or uh, always when I'm listening to a podcast or listening to a book. So I'm doing two things at once. Um, but there, my home is pretty tidy, but there are papers that need to be filed or thrown away. Uh, there are books I'd like to read. Um, maybe my floor needs washing, but I want to sit and play games, listen to books, and 
that it's like an addiction in a way, I mean, not completely addiction, but it's it's so rewarding. I don't know what exactly the reward center in my brain is that's affected, but that's what I want to do. And I can do that for hours. And meanwhile, another day has gone by and there are these things that I have not done that I really would like to do. So, so you feel a nagging feeling that you're not utilizing time properly. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What a nagging. <laughs> I mean, I guess the guide would say that whatever negativity exists, whatever whatever negative things are lurking, maybe that's not a good word, but whatever the negativity is, or the anger, whatever there is underneath needs to be explored. Otherwise, you'd feel at ease with, with everything. Oh, is it avoiding negativity or is there, what is this, um, this compulsion to seek these kinds of pleasure? You know, I'm playing Wordle, the daily Wordle, or I'm uh, doing paint by number. Mm. They're so, I don't think before I got involved in those activities, I had this <laughs> phenomenon that I'm describing now. Tracy, any thoughts about that? Well, I think you do, you're doing what you want to be doing. I know, but for hours and hours and hours and not doing other things I want to do. Well, month I mean, after month, that doesn't, what, it doesn't feel good. I, I have a question. What would be the things that you would want to be doing or that you think you should be doing? Things that I just described, you know, putting, ordering my papers, putting them away, throwing them away, reading books. Um, Oh, I okay. Hiding, doing maybe some housekeeping. Melissa. Go ahead. Well, when you when you really want to be doing something else, you will. Right? At the rate I'm going, I could be dead by then. <laughs> well, I mean, like you really you really showed up, Meff, you know, in life, didn't you? I mean, you showed up, right? So what more, what more can one do than show up in life and then, and then move forward, you know? Maybe you, you're entitled to a period of relaxation without, uh, right. you know, and like, you know, hire a cleaning company to, you know, get, get, the, get the house together, you know, let it go. Right. I mean, Stephen would just say, well, it is. Yeah, yeah. Stephen. Yeah. Stephen yeah, go ahead, Kev. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it matches exactly what Stephen was saying, actually. Um, and I think I just want to add a little bit to it because, um, you know, my mom, before she passed, she had a very, well, I guess, re revel revelatory experience of finally realizing kind of more of what's important um, in her existence. Um, she put away a lot of the things that she once used to labor over incessantly, and, and perhaps it was compulsion, right, for much, much of her life. But she recognized that, yeah, I mean, now's the time for me to spend you know, playing Wordle or uh, doing crossword puzzles or, um, you know, listening to her favorite music. Um, and sure, the bushes did not get cut in the yard. That's for sure. Um, and, and maybe she hired somebody at some point or she had me come over more often. But all I'm saying is, I think it's important. There's the, it's the judgment of the inactivity uh, that perhaps you could look into more because you're labeling something about it as bad or right or or non or non desirous in a way and so i would just suggest that you look both into what the ideas of that activity mean to you um so from a thought perspective as well as from a desire perspective um so both from the emotional state and from the thought process and perhaps one is feeding your intellect, one is feeding your attention, one is feeding, you know, just being absorbed in something. Uh, perhaps it's taking you away from something that you may not be wanting to think about or do or the labor. Um, but yet again, I think as, as Tracy said pretty clearly, if you wanted to do the other things more than play those games, it certainly would happen. So it's just a question mark of short-term gains versus long-term gains. And um, you know, balancing, I guess, the, the 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 conflicting states that occur within you. I, I do the same, by the way. I mean, what you're basically—I mean, it's not—it's not—it's not just you. You know, 
I, I, I walk around pretty much while I'm working and my thoughts are somewhere else and I want to be doing some other activity and I tend to drift right into those other activities because they're more immediately pleasurable, whether or not that's to my intellect or to my emotional state or whatever it might be. So just, I would say, don't beat yourself up about it because that adds nothing to the process except one more layer to have to work through to get to the heart of uh, what Steven basically said, <laughs> which was which was the most pragmatic thing Steven said, like perfectly just, hey, it, it is what it is, <laughs> you know, it's just, meditative. it's very meditative. Yeah. Yes, Stephen, exactly. You play hard, you play hard. Right, <laughs> right. Now, now, just the last item I wanted to add to that is that traditionally when we're wrapped up into objects, which we all are, okay, we're all going from, our attention is going from one thing to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing, whether or not that's cleaning the floors, or washing the dishes, which can be very Zen, okay, or playing Wordle, okay, your attention. It, 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 there's a compulsion traditionally in humans to not want to just be with yourself. And, and I'm not saying this is pathological or anything. I'm not saying this is a problem. I'm saying this is a common problem with all humans. The, the meditative state of just backing away from being attentive to something and just sinking into your own self-awareness might provide you some more of that reflection ability, that unitive state that, that Alan was talking mm -hmm. about. So take time with yourself if you can, away from everything, including all the compulsory stuff that you have to do. And maybe that will open up some area of your heart where you can then see that a little clearer. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Well, any thoughts? So long you know, <clears throat> not so much. I mean, uh, it's clearly, you know, when we when he, when I heard the kind of the the title of the lectures, oh wow, time, you know, astrophysics, you know, <laughs> you know, all these kind of big, big things about space and time and movement. But to me, after after think of it, I mean, I, I think to me, I mean, we can really talk. The, the path of the pathwork without that even to me in a simple way, which I mean, I mean, for me, everybody fights for resources. And, you know, for us conceptually, we're talking about time and space and movement. And I think ultimately it's about kind of like the lower self against the higher self, kind of. Everybody's fighting for space and time and resources. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if we yeah. cultivate that higher self, there is no need to talk about all these elements because you're going to be flowing in the current and present moment. Right. Well, the question, the issue is how do we get out of the pain that we so, experience because we are not in the unit of space? That's, that's the work. That's the path. Yeah. And regardless of understanding of that concept, I think, and something that comes up to my mind, you know, <clears throat> it seems like, you know, if you're talking about unconscious and negativity, that as if they are stuck in the past, but they want to pretend they are in the present moment and they're always kind of pushing as if this is the present issue mm -hmm. and we should focus on that. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it's kind yes. of like a manipulation of that, but now we need to access that deeper, go to understand as Kevin says about it's their- idealized self-image, what you're really referencing there. Of course. Yeah, right. So once, we, so once we realize that, hopefully, we can go unstuck mm. from the unconscious negativity to truly be in the in the moment. And then I think we can utilize time in, in the best way. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I see it. Yeah, I think that uh, that word unstuck, I think is very helpful uh, because that really describes how we're bound to, to uh, we're bound to as this kind of con conflicted state where we, we are we're running away from the present moment uh into the past we're afraid of the future it's funny we're kind of holding ourselves stuck or paralyzed when all we have to do is to go into what we're afraid of going into and then we find the liberation of uh, we find a feeling of freedom then i think when, when we think about it from, the, from an aspect of energy it's combined all this element all together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we are stuck, we are stuck. We are holding that energy. We don't let it flow. 
mm -hmm. when it wants to allow it to flow, mm -hmm. then we are in the present moment allowing everything just yeah, as a absolutely. vehicle, vehicle, you know, for you know, for the higher self. Well, the guide moves from the the, the mental work, the emotional work, and then to the energetic work in a lot of the later lectures. And so you do the energy work. If you're if you're aware of your energy and your blocks, that goes a long way because then you don't need to waste the time in pounding pillows and crying anymore. You know, I mean, the pounding pillows and crying was really a helpful phase. But what it teaches you is how your energy is flowing. That's all it's really doing because it is helping you unblock, of course. But ultimately, you know, it's like a doctor. You know, do you really need to cut open the body to actually solve this problem? Or can you solve it with some other less invasive means? And that's the energy state. I think if you can become more completely aware of the energy state through the process that the path work is talking about, mm -hmm. then you can really do that work without necessarily, you know, <laughs> you know, pulling your skin off basically every single yeah, time. Yeah, that's a very valuable insight. You know, did everybody hear that? Kevin was talking about how the guy talks about moving from the mental to the emotional and then to the energetic work. Yeah, I think just to repeat, I think that overall, the path work process tends to start in the mental side of it to discuss concepts and look at images and come up with these, you know, very analytical thoughts, doing housekeeping and so forth. Then it goes into the emotional and it really starts digging through all of this emotional baggage. And then lastly, it kind of moves into the energetic state because, and, and, the, and the guide even states later on, to learn this too soon might be a detriment. So we talk about this later, right? Because you don't want to shortcut the emotional work. But once you do enough of that emotional work and pounding the pillows and crying and ripping off your skin and all that good, good meaty stuff that, you know, sells well on TV. Um, basically, you know, you can move to a state where you can feel where the energy blocks are within you. Um, they'll tend to arise within your, your body as well. And, and this will correspond to your emotional state where the emotions are being held in your body. And then doing the energy work, like Mush was saying, was basically where you're where you can basically take care of the issue with a lot less invasiveness um, or in, invasion of the- Do you think that, you know, the asking for help from the spiritual realms oh. and the guy says asking for help from, from Christ are aspects of the energetic work? Absolutely. Absolutely, because you're tethering yourself to a context that's far greater than what your ego can conceive of. Even what your ego tries to conceive of with the sense of what the higher self is, it does a piss poor job, to be honest with you. And the, I mean, once you realize that your ego can't grasp that, and no matter how much it tries to grasp it, it's just idolatry when it tries to look at what the higher self is. And so when you really call out in need or surrender, Right? When you really surrender yourself to some power that's far greater than your ego self, mm -hmm. then, of course, you're, you're latching on to a context that's far greater. Right, but you have to do the purification you work have. first yeah. to be able to do that yeah, successfully. Yes, yes, you won't hear the voice. Right, Juan, I'm sure you would self. agree with that. Oh, yes. <laughs> In fact, I want to comment a little bit on that, if I'm allowed. Uh, yeah, and I try to be quick. And this is something that you read on page three. Um, you know, this is the one, two, three, four, five, uh, the fifth paragraph on page three, right? And you read this, and uh, what the guy says if each moment we're truly lived to its fullest, you would already reach an extended dimension of time while still remaining in this earth dimension. Uh, the truth is that only by fully utilizing the dimension you live in can you outgrow it. Um, so I just want to comment a little bit on that. And it's just that to me, that's, um, that's basically what the path work is about. You know, that taking that moment, you know, living that present moment, facing, um, confronting all that is there in that moment, all that comes up either is hate or comfort or shame or, or depression, any kind of emotion that comes to the surface of your awareness. Um, you know, you, you, you want to be in that moment. You want to face it. You want to uh, experience whatever it is, even though it feels uh, uncomfortable, <clears throat> even though it feels disturbing, even though it doesn't feel right in the beginning to, to confront it. But once you do, and you really go through that feeling and you really live through it, uh, you know, what you described earlier also, it's like that relief, that joy, that, that soothing calmness that you feel right afterwards, because 
really, we know that all this negativity that we face in this uh, earthly existence is nothing but a distorted state of the actual thing. You know, hate is just, a, you know, a distortion of negative pure currents, right? And so is any other negativity that we face or that we encounter in this plane. So by going through those feelings and experiencing them, um, we, we, we liberate ourselves. And, and as the guy explains here, this is the best way to use um, that time. And uh, I like what he said right afterwards, that, and you also read this part, um, where he said awareness is the first step. Because that really is it, right? And once you uh, mm -hmm, once mm -hmm. you feel that, it's like, oh, wait a minute, what is it that I'm feeling? You're like in the case of the, um, the procrastination earlier, she's feeling she, she you know, that may not be the right words, like she's saying. I mean, I mean, we use those words, but you know, like words like you said are symbol are symbols. Um, but just facing that, the minute she encounters that and feel and feels that, oh, yeah. there is something here that doesn't feel right. I mean, just sitting there doing whatever else she right. wants, she's doing. But obviously, she's, she's not feeling comfortable with this. So, so you know what's interesting? Right? Just you know what's interesting about what you said is like you you move into the. Let me pause. Oh, sorry. When you move into when, when you move into the energetic state of seeing what uh, Juan was saying, you you can you can see whether or not you can feel whether or not a given feeling is distortion, exactly. right? Without right. even needing to label it. You right. can feel exactly. the distortion. Yeah, now, exactly. and then you can also feel in what area that distortion is arising and that constriction feels. And, and sure, if for a long period of time, and I mean for years, decades, it could be for lifetimes, it may be necessary to delve into the emotional work, to trace certainly to trace that. And, that. and there's nothing wrong with that. That's a very important stage for sure. But it does lead to a place where you ultimately can sense the nature of what's arising so that you can see what's in this lecture. This lecture states explicitly that when the emotions are positive emotions, and, and I, I believe the guide labels these emotions, then there is no non-utilization of the time, right? It's right. really, it's the negative emotional state that kind of is like a bing, 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 right? And it just, it lights up the whole thing to what, to what Juan was saying. It's a sign of it, right? That work needs to be done. Yes. And, and as soon as you see that, that is a positive thing. To see the negative is a positive. Right. As soon as you see that. Yes. yes. Well, to see the negative is a positive. Right. The yeah, because it's, it's showing us, it's showing yeah, us the negative. That's why it's the God. The pings are like blessings because they show you where you need to look. Right. They show you where the distortion still is. A, so like any of the negative things right. are really disguised blessings for us to see where we need to look and, a little farther. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, are we utilizing our time well? Show of hands. <laughs> Man. <laughs> you know, Alan, I, the, the, the one paragraph that really struck me was um, the fact that I'm uncomfortable in the present, and I am, I am uncomfortable in the present, because the present is, is usually not that great. <clears throat> Either I've got an ache or a pain or I'm bored or I'm angry or I'm, I'm, I want to get even or, or some other nasty thing. Nice. And it's not that great. And therefore, for me, the present is just a bridge to the next moment. So this present isn't really present at all. It's a bridge. But then again, that bridge with enough bridges leads me into the future. And what is the future holding? my death yeah therefore i'm afraid of the bridge i'm afraid of the bridge and i don't like the moment well i'm pretty much fucked <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> you know, except one or the other <laughs> I mean, uh yeah yeah no i mean hey you put it very succinctly steve you just need to accept that he's fucked and yeah. that's yeah. going to be okay. Yeah. Be yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so Stephen, <laughs> this to go full circle, this brings back to, I wish I, Alan has it recorded. So it's what you said before about just being with the feeling, 
right? Because now what, you, what I observe, you are layering thought on your experience of yourself. Of the, so the moment is uncomfortable, right? The liberation right. is, according to what you said, and I agree with that, is just being with that discomfort and keep looking to see where it's coming from, okay? <clears throat> so I experienced discomfort as well most of the time, and it came to me that my, my father was very explosive. And I never knew any, fortunately was, I wasn't the object of his anger, but just being around the anger is dis discomforting, right? And so right. it came to me that my defense mechanism in, in being in the present moment was a certain level of discomfort, right? So if I'm always a little uncomfortable when there's an explosion, it's a form of, of defense, right? And once that came to me, right that my my experience of myself in the present moment is 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 disquieting it's just it's uncomfortable then that helped for it to to release that i could breathe and realize it's okay right so i would say just so you just see it you see it for what it is let yourself feel it where is it in your body that you said this is it in your gut, right? Where is it? Where are you feeling this, this discomfort? And, and just observe it, just accept it and say, okay, this is it. And then breathe, right? And then when you're ready to, to it, maybe you'll see something, maybe something will come up or, or it won't and it's okay, right? And then the other aspect, so, uh, we were talking about projecting into the future. So, you, so there's something about death that is unresolved. Mm -hmm. Right. So I would say if death has a hold, which which the pathwork tells us death is an illusion, right? It does, it's a construct that's part of part of to create this illusion of time, right? To make time important. Now I need to use this because I only have so much, but that's not really true. We have time is infinite, right? Because we don't there is no death. The pathwork in the question and answer, the first question talks about the fact of how on the other side, what was it, Alan? There's time, there's movement, and there's space, and, uh, and they're all combined. And so we are in the moment all the time. There is movement is just uh, uh, occurs by, by thought, right? So we have the capacity to be multiple places simultaneously on the other side. That's my understanding. So anyway, that's, that's <clears throat> what I reflect back from what I'm hearing you say. And, and so maybe it's, vision your death you know see the casket see what what are people going to say what where are you what's going to happen to mm -hmm. steven uh explore it right and so that it, it 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 what what where are you feeling that in your body and you know what are the images what what are your mm -hmm. thoughts that's associated with this right I, I appreciate what you're saying and um i agree i agree I, you know if i could truly believe that what the path work says there's no such thing as death it's kind of like well i'm home free but you know i'm a bit like woody allen he said you know i don't mind dying i just don't want to be there when it happens <laughs> <laughs> all right we'll save this for another discussion <laughs> yeah go ahead yeah very very quick to steven Stephen, it was that was a great quote, by the way. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I wanted to add something to Joel's because Joel's was a, a a jewel right there. Okay, about experiencing the emotion. But one of the things I want to reflect on is just recognize that emotions change. Okay, Rec I mean, just before you even go into that state, just set your higher self the bar. The bar of your higher self is going to bring some rationale to this, and it's going to say, "Look, emotions change." All right, thoughts change, okay, but you don't, or your awareness doesn't change. You are not your emotions. You are not your thoughts, okay? Those things are things that you have. Those things are not you, okay? And so they appear a lot less cataclysmic and they appear a lot less personal when you recognize that they're arising for a Stephen that really is just a conception of you, 
okay? Right. They're arising from a personality many times that you've painted of yourself that exists because of the things that you find are were important or meaningful or, or dreadful or I don't wanna do that ever again, okay? And yet all of it can't really affect the true spark that lies within you, Stephen. Okay. And your Thank higher you. self will tell you that. It will tell you that in your quietest moments, listen for that voice. And I promise you, you've never had an experience of not existing, right? What would that be like anyway? The experience of not existing. Okay. So, so your experience tells you that your awareness always is. Okay. And you always are. Okay. And so, so it makes those emotional states a lot simpler to manage when they arise. You don't <laughs> need to lose yourself in it. Okay. Love you, man. <laughs> I hear you. And miss you too. Okay. You. Miss you too. <laughs> I hear you. I was thinking that when you talked about those momentary discomforts, I was thinking, um, I had this image of a, um, well, like, let's say, there's a park and there's a light, it's, it's nighttime and there's a lamp and the lamp is shining on something. Let's say that's discomfort, but all kinds of other things are around it in the dark that you can't see. So if you expand your consciousness, you say, what's here besides the discomfort? What else is here? All kinds of things are here. There's a whole reality that lots of things that you're not seeing. So it's a lot, if the ego wants to focus on the discomfort, but if you relax and surrender and say, okay, I feel the discomfort, but what else is here? I kind of have that, that feeling, yeah. right? All right, my friends. So what's the best way to utilize the rest of the time that we have? Any other thoughts? Well, I just, the only thing I wanted to just add was um, uh, maybe that feeling of flow that happens sometimes when you're involved in, um, uh, you know, all aspects of yourself involved in something that maybe that is like an inkling of a different time state. Yeah, 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 yeah we agree. That's all. Teresa, Melissa, you want to say anything? Well, we could certainly meditate. Um, what I want to uh, let me yeah, go ahead. one last key point that uh, the guy actually pointed out in the, um, the last uh, paragraph of his lecture. I think it's very important, you know, to all what we have talked about here tonight. Oh, yeah, we didn't talk about the Q and A's right at the end. Of yeah, time. yeah, that's one part is very, very important. But uh, what the way he, the way when he's uh, like actually finalizing the lecture, something that uh, struck me a little, a little bit was that um, the last paragraph here, when he said um, this is about almost in the middle of it, like on the third of it beginning from the top, uh, where he says that you may utilize, I mean, among other things, so that you may utilize it fearlessly, neither straining toward the future nor standing up against it. Uh, so to me, this word here, fearlessly, because the, I think, uh, you know, most of what we have talked about here tonight, uh, what I perceive is that fear is really one of the greatest factors that's involved here that is keeping us away from, um, you know, from actually uh, uh, facing and encountering and, and really venturing it into that unknown, into, into that, uh, you know, that space that seems, uh, uh, you know, that seems obscure, that seems uh, dark and that seems unknown and that seems uh, threatening. And, and fear, uh, the way the guy says it here, if we fear lessly, uh, we can leave fear out and really uh, venture into uh, experiencing and, and, and confronting all these, uh, you know, these unknown parts of ourselves, uh, we will really be able to uh, connect with a higher being within and then surrender to either word that we use a few times tonight. Um, to me, that's the, it boils down to that, to that basically being able to uh, putting the fear aside and really surrender to the higher being 
within and just allow it to, to work through us and, and, and help us and guide us, um, you know, to, 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 to perform uh, whatever work it is or whatever uh, uh, work with that, with that we need to do that is stopping and so, uh, prohibiting us from, um, from really, really, really connecting uh, and really allowing that, um, that you know, enormous power to, um, to guide us. And, and it would just take us to, you know, where we have never been to the land of uh, ever new joy, you know, but the fear, I think, is the main factor that is stopping us from doing that. Right. And I think that, uh, the, of course, there's this triad of self will, pride and fear. That's right. Yeah. That is such an important lecture. And oh, yeah. so in order to let the fear go, you have to let the pride go. Yes. And you have yeah. to let the self will go. And the self will. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They all interconnect. Those even. things. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> If we yeah. can let our pride go, which is what we do in the path work, when we confront our bullshit mm. and, and share with other people, we can let that go. And then the self-will means, you know what? I know the ego doesn't know what to do. It has no clue. It doesn't know what to do next. Yeah. So we have to let that self-will, which is the, the will of the ego, the little ego, as, as the mm. guy would say, let that go. And then we can face the fear. Then we could let the fear go. Yeah. Right. All right. So, my friends, uh, let's have our meditation. Let's get a candle. Thank you so much for coming. Good to see you, right? Yeah. Okay. Bye. 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 All right, I'm going to read the last paragraph and then we'll meditate for 15 minutes. Unless anyone wants to say anything else. Who's ready? I feel grateful, so grateful for the energy that we're able to generate. Yes. Yes. Right? You share. share. All right. So I'm going to read the paragraph, then we're going to meditate on these words. May these words not merely pass through your brain. May they, they indeed give you the incentive to listen deeply within yourself in order to gain a little distance from yourself. Just by gaining more objectivity, you may become more at home with yourself and feel more at ease with life in this fragment of time so that you may utilize it fearlessly, neither straining toward the future nor stemming against it. Therefore, you will be in harmony with the flow of time. Thus, gradually, through the discoveries about your innermost hidden attitudes and emotions, you will find yourself flowing with the wave of time in harmony with it, living each now to the fullest. May all of my good friends, those who are present and those who are absent, those who are new and those who are hesitant, those who may contemplate to begin a new way of inner life, may you all find your real self and thus eventually overcome the barrier that makes you tend to the visible manifestation while being blind to what causes it. Be in peace. May you find the strength and the reality that I try to help you find. Be blessed, be in God.